Greetings, everyone. Wilkinson here. I'm back. And today my guest is Donald Brophy. Hello. How you doing, Wilkinson? I'm great. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. So you are the husband of Emrys Cooper, who was here on my last podcast. That's right. Yes. Let's keep it all in the family. <laughs> the old ball and chain. <laughs> yep. So who are you? Tell people who you are. I am a... That's a good question, really, isn't it? Yep. Uh, I could wax lyrical about that for many, uh, many hours, but I, I guess who I am is Donald Brophy. I'm a, a 44-year-old Irish immigrant who has turned his hand on many a trade here in the great United States, and things, careers, paths, situations have led me to where I am today, where I am living in... Palm Springs and Idlewild with my husband and we have a production company together. Well, that sounds like fun. What's the production company called? Our production company is called Idlewild Pictures, named after our beloved little mountain town that we moved to during COVID called I'm, Idlewild. I'm totally insulted. Why wasn't it Palm Springs and not Idlewild? <laughs> <laughs> well, we moved to Idlewild first. Okay, so that got first um, yeah, and also Palm Springs gets lots of attention. Right. I'd was not so much. It's all that, it's that mysterious little town up there on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. It's um it basically just a little unincorporated little hamlet where people used to drive cattle through oh. up until like eighty years ago. A bunch of hippies moved up there and bada bing, bada boom. Right. How did you end up there? During COVID, uh, we were living in Los Angeles and we decided to take a weekend break up there. Emerson said Spent some time up there many years ago, and he had always spoke very highly of it. So we decided to take a weekend up there, and well, he went up first, and then I followed him. But I actually, funny story, put Idlewild in the GPS, and I drove to Idlewild, Northern California, an hour south of San Francisco. No way. Yeah, yeah, Idlewild with an E as opposed to a Y. And um, yeah, went oh, into this. No. Yeah, I went into this small post office, and I was like, "Hello, I'm looking for the Strawberry Creek Inn." This is like Trump country, you know, right? And uh, I was like looking for the Strawberry Creek Inn. They were like, "There ain't no place called the Strawberry Creek Inn around here." So anyway, they sent me down. They were like, "I think there's a place down in San Diego called Idlewild." Also, and I was like, "Oh, sweet lord!" So I put it in. Lo and behold, a four hour drive. I had already been on the road like three and a half hours. Oh so. no. Yeah, so that was my first foray, but I, it was all worth it. I got up to Idlewild and I was blown away. I mean, it's 6,000 feet elevation and, you know, in the San, San Jacinto wilderness, and it's just a very special place. Are you at a vantage point looking out at something? We are. We were very lucky, but we went, to, we went up there for the weekend, basically, long story short, and we decided that we'd buy property because we were looking for a place in Los Angeles and we couldn't really afford anything that was half decent. So we bought an amazing kind of fixer-upper up there in the mountains and we did it. So it's a very grown-up house. Sometimes I, like, I can't believe it. But yeah, it's uh, we back onto the San Jacinto National Forest. Oh, that's so correct. basically, there's no, you know, nobody can build near us essentially, and it's just I'm not, like, I'm not even kidding you, like a thousand miles of unobstructed views. It's amazing. You can even see the ocean from San Diego. Oh, seriously? Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Wow. Yeah. And I read a little bit about it. I saw a blurb. So you gutted the house. We did. Yeah, we took it down to the studs, and I, I become. Uh, someone experienced because I had bars and restaurants for many. I lived in New York for 20 years and I had right. bars and restaurants. And we were a small little restaurant group that couldn't necessarily afford like fancy interior designers. So I would do it myself. And as a result, I developed kind of an eye and an aptitude for interior design and renovation. So you were the primary leader on that? I was. Emerson will probably be a baby. Mortally wounded to be saying that, but yeah, he was busy editing our movie, so he was oh, really? He was killing it in other aspects. So, do you like Idlewild or Palm Springs better? <laughs> um, they're so different, they're so different. I always, you know, like whenever I'm up in Idlewild, whenever I get to Idlewild, I'm always like, Oh, I love Idlewild so much, I think I prefer it up here, it's so quiet. And then after like two weeks, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm ready to go to like a gym and uh, get Thai food and right. go to the cinema. <laughs> right. So yeah, it's good life. We call it palms to pines, which is kind of funny because we go from palm trees to palm trees. I mean, only in California could you do that in the space of an hour and 15 right. minutes. It's really crazy. It really is a nice combo you got there. Yeah. Although now the world is opening back up and work is busy again. And I wonder how long that can be our reality. I, I think we're getting drawn back to 
Los Angeles, New York and London quite a bit. And it's very difficult sometimes like with travel, uh, even though I love Palm Springs Airport, it can be a little difficult sometimes with like trying to like say fly to Ireland. And I, you know, I just did, shot a TV show in Ireland actually and I had to kind of get myself back there and it was, it's just a bit of a schlep. Well, you must surrender your passports to me. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You can keep me prisoner in this gorgeous house. Well, yeah. in okay, let's talk a little about your production company. How did that form and why did you do it? Well, uh, it was very strange. I mean, not a lot of couples, I think, w could say this, but when, when Emerson and I met, it was kind of like an explosion of creativity. Like right away, we just started to write together, work together, which is, it was the most natural thing I'd never had that before in a relationship like my relationships were very like my relationship and my work kind of a thing but with him everything just blended I suppose it was because we had such similar tastes and he was such a I was so impressed by his his work ethic and and his his balls essentially he had a real neck on him he wasn't afraid to do you know like do things reach for the stars ask people for things which sounds very strange but in my business you really have to be not afraid to kind of be like hey can we you know like do this reach out like cold calls whatever and I wasn't like that I was a little shy and a little insecure about like you know because I'd just gotten out of the restaurant business and I was tipping my toe back in the entertainment business so I was a little bit kind of shy about it and he was and so we were a good combo and then we decided that we would write this we Emers came up with this great idea uh, for our first movie called The Shuru Process available on all streaming platforms I watched it this morning <laughs> And um, so he had this idea and then we, I loved it. And we basically start, we wrote it together. It took us like around a year to write it from soup to nuts. And then we had to do a lot of like fundraising and all the rest, but we managed to get the money together and we shot it in upstate New York over the space of like 25 days. It took us a long time to edit it because COVID came and a lot of like, there was a lot of difficulty around around the movie in terms of like we moved to California we had went through various editors that weren't working sound mixing we had to raise more money all this kind of stuff so it was very very difficult process it's a miracle that we got it finished never mind sold and distributed around the world it's it's mm. crazy you know I was thinking when I was watching it toward the end you know with my photography or a play or a movie I mean to me my goal would be to make people think and feel and, and you really did that in that movie because oh, well, I, I I was touched several places. Well, thank you. And, you know, it did come from a very personal place, especially with Emerus because his family has a lot of trauma around, the, you know, charlatan gurus. Yeah. But the scene where they were on the mountaintop and they threw their personal thing away over the side. Oh, yeah. I felt I felt that absolutely. It was oh, like, really? It just, it That's just, a real exercise. Yeah, it hit, I know, and, but it hit me. And I've probably done something like that because I've done a lot of work on stuff. Yeah. But, but I, I relived it. Ah, yeah. it was very, well, there you go. I mean, I, you know, I, I, funny, I just had somebody reach out to me, like I'm actually a second cousin of mine reached out to me on, on Instagram there again, again, had a very, um, visceral reaction right. to the movie too. And that makes it so worthwhile and so fulfilling when you just, when you, cause you know, it's very easy to forget all that because you're so focused on just getting it done, getting it done. And then you realize that. It leaves you with a lot. Of the, uh, one thing I will say is that about that movie is that it definitely leaves you with a lot of food for thought. Like there's a lot we we were very ambitious with it, and we got we fit a lot into a little a yeah. little small budget yeah. kind of kind right. of thing. Um, and your actors were really great. I mean, I really related to a lot of them. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I do have a question though. So when I was watching it, the the colors were very vivid. Was that intentional? Yeah, you'll notice when it starts in New York, it's it's very gray and yeah. sharp, right? And then when um, she goes up to the retreat in upstate New York, it becomes almost like Technicolor, and it, it's right. so gay. But I kind of wanted to be a little bit like the Wizard of Oz, like she was kind of she's no longer she's not in Kansas anymore. I By the way, the movie is kind of it's it's you know just for your listeners, it's it's basically about a. A, a female journalist whose life falls off a cliff in New York, and uh, she, her, she get her, her makes a fool of herself. She has a drug and alcohol problem. Makes a fool of herself at a work event, gets fired. Her boyfriend dumps her, and she basically spirals. And her friends send her to a processing center, quote unquote, in upstate New York, run by kind of a hipster guru, played by yours truly. And as clarity sets in with her, and she dries out from all the booze and coke, she's as sharp as a tack, and she starts noticing certain things about this retreat that don't seem quite right there you go <laughs>
But what I also thought before I got to the end was even though things weren't quote unquote quite right, it still affected the people that were there. Well, this is yeah. it. And yeah. this is like, that, that was the ultimate question. And that's why I was so pleased with the finished product because it is quite nuanced. Right. I'm a firm believer that, you know, like anything in life, you get into it, you get out of it what you put into it, right? right. And if the and if the participants were open, then they're going to receive. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like I had members of my family that were like devout Catholics and, and, and I grew up Catholic, you know, like tr traditionally and, you know, culturally Catholic. And I definitely really have fond memories of, of their traditions around that institution. Now, uh, am, am I still involved in my practicing? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, but I do think that, you know, a lot of these people had very, very profound spiritual lives because of that institution. We all know that institution is completely corrupt. It's like the oldest racket known to humanity. But that said, you take one step towards the universe and the universe will take one, two steps right. <laughs> towards you. So prayer is the most powerful thing in the universe. I, at the end of the day, that's what I think. Whether it's chanting, whether it's praying to Jesus, whether it's praying to Allah, like whoever, whatever your, whatever your God is, whatever your spiritual practice, praying, taking a moment out and, and going in, going inside yourself and sending the signals out to the universe that you're contemplating your life is very powerful. Well, you're throwing the seeds out basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> so let's talk about your latest project, the homo one. <laughs> Yeah, we we talked earlier, and I I know it's historical homos, but I and I keep thinking in my head historical because there's so many drama. <laughs> all your friends are <laughs> they're drama drama queens. queens. <laughs> yeah, just keep on thinking of all those. Right. Yeah, historical homos. Uh, first episode drops June 9th on Deku, which is a gay streamer, but you, it's an add-on for Amazon Prime too, so it's basically available on Amazon Prime. Historical homos. Yeah, the world's first no beeps given guide to queer history. Uh, We're in the middle of the podcast, you can say it. Oh, yeah. The world's already <laughs> no fucks give a guy to queer history. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a interesting. I've always been a history nerd. Uh -huh. um, I've always like, you know, like, I don't know. I guess I'm one of those people that was kind of, I got a little bit like left behind by the schooling system in Ireland. Like, right. you know, I didn't do quite well in school. Like, I mean, nobody took an interest in me. And like, I got a couple of okay teachers, but like, nah. I, but I was, I was too worried about like being gay or being cool or whatever, you know, like I was very preoccupied. I always managed to get by. Like I wasn't, I never, fa I didn't fail anything. I don't, I don't remember ever opening a book though. It's so strange. Really? Like obviously outside of school, I opened books in school right. when I was on the premises in the classroom, but I don't remember ever coming home and like studying. It's so weird. But I read ferociously. So I'm a bit of a self-taught, I'm an autodidact is how I would quite pretty much describe myself. I was always reading historical fiction and nonfiction from a very young age. So I kind of like inadvertently, uh, you know, I'm quite dyslexic. So I, I was mixing my B's and my D's up and all this, my handwriting was terrible, but I was reading about Cortez. I was reading about Elizabeth I. I was reading about Shakespeare. I was reading about Galileo at a very young age. So as a result, I've always had a, a real love for history. And as as I got older, I, I started to realize that a lot of history has been straight washed. Now we'll look at some. We were talking about that word earlier on. Um, and it's, straight, it's, it's a new word to me, but it's very descriptive. Yeah, I mean, it says it all. Basically, our, our, a lot of it has been amazing characters from history that were gay, that people either just like straight washed them, never mentioned that they were gay or tried to hide that they were gay, or people that were just made huge impacts on the world and were just intentionally left behind because of their sexual orientation. You know, certain it's all starting to come out. Like, I mean, you're Turin, who basically cracked the, the code for the, the Nazi code and basically brought an end to World War II. And, you know, like he was one that kind of like kind of came to mind in the popular culture because they made the movie about him. But there's so many characters like that. So we decided that it would be our mission to unearth and bring to light queer history, queer characters through history and uh, explain to our audience in a very fun, relatable way, uh, you know, tell them about their lives and bring in fun guests that can speak to their experience or their line of work. So when you said we, who are you referring to? Well, my co-host, Mr. Sebastian Hendra, who goes by Bash, like Cher. Um, <laughs> and like Wilkinson. Like Wilkinson. But he, uh, yeah, so he's my co-host and he's great. He right. comes from like a, a long line of tomfoolery. His dad is, was um, Tony Hendra, who was in This is Spinal Tap. He played the, um, the English manager. And then he also 
established that was one of the establishing members of Monty Python and all this kind of stuff. So he's just this. Uh, I like to describe him as a I describe him as a enfant terrible. He's a little younger than me, but he's like a like a nerdy little graduate from Cambridge and Oxford, a slutty little nerdy graduate. And yeah, he's great. He does like a lot of the research and then I, we come in and I'm kind of the everyman. We talk about like uh, each of the characters and he explains it and I ask him questions, dumb questions mostly. <laughs> I don't think they were too dumb. <laughs> Good. <laughs> they were dumb actually. We finished four episodes with Deku and um, yeah, so we're going to do, we're going to do the rest of the season probably the end of the summer or so and we'll see probably with Deku but we'll see where that goes and yeah we have so many potential episodes lined up that we're really excited we think that this could be something that we could really bring into the future and hopefully breaks through we have so many fun ideas around it to do like live shows and all sorts of like fun merch and all the rest of it so yeah we're super excited about it really excited about it I was a little surprised the topic on your first episode. That was that was kind of ballsy. Oh yeah. <laughs> Toxic in, boyfriends of yeah, Greek mythology. Right. In today's you know, in today's culture especially, I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. They're really going for it here. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you know, it's just like that's kind of like that's our approach. We're like, why not? And I, and my listeners are gonna have to listen to yours to see what you know, see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll keep it a mystery. Yeah. But like we really go there yeah. with the Athenians. Yeah. So are there any characters in the past that you discovered were gay that, you know, there wasn't a general question out there? Well, there's a lot of people that were brought to light to me that I'd never really heard of that. And when I heard the impact that they've made, I was very shocked to hear that Shakespeare's sonnets, they had changed that they changed the pronouns. Uh, Shakespeare's sonnets, like, you know, over a hundred years ago, they were all written to a young man. And they were all changed to female pronouns. That was, I thought that was quite shocking. I couldn't believe that I didn't hear about that before in high school or something. And then I learned a lot about Virginia Woolf, who I always knew was was queer, but I wasn't quite, you know, sure. But, I, but then I knew she married um, a man, so I wasn't quite sure. But no, she was full on. And she had like a very on again, off again, dramatic, chic <laughs> relationship with this amazing woman called Vita Sackville West who in a lot of ways is a little bit more interesting than Virginia. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was like very, she cut quite a swath of terror across like Edwardian London. She was the daughter of a very old aristocratic family and um, but just didn't really like wrote, wrote, she was actually more famous than Virginia in her time. She had several bestsellers. Uh, Virginia's books weren't really that popular when she was alive, unfortunately for her, as usual. You know, it's always the bloody way. But um, yeah, so I was kind of, I found a lot about these characters and also Marlowe. I didn't know Marlowe, Shakespeare, you know, Shakespeare's contemporary, Christopher Marlowe. I didn't know he was gay, very overtly gay and kind of like a like a rock star gay, like very, I was, I was joked that he was almost like a Kurt Cobain character in oh, really? Elizabethan England. Yeah, he was just kind of like a, so I actually smoked opium, like slept with a load of the actors at the Globe. And then he was a spy in France and he was like really good friends with Elizabeth I. But like, you know, he basically called her on her shit and event ended up kind of being assassinated in a pub one day over, a, they say over an unpaid bill. But it was how do you get kind of assassinated? Well, he was, he, well, he was definitely <laughs> murdered, but they, I, 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 but it's questionable. I think he was assassinated. Yeah. Cause he knew too much. He was also a big part of, we can really nerd out now, but he was a, a big part of the Babington plot, which basically brought down Mary Queen of Scots. And a lot of the evidence that was levied at Mary was doctored or else just, you know, straight up plagiarized. And he knew a lot about that. And Mary Elizabeth had executed an anointed queen. Really, really. Even even in that time when there was a lot of skullduggery going on and vicious, you know, kind of all sorts of holocausts going on with against Protestants and Jews and all the rest. So even for that time, that was pretty shocking that Elizabeth beheaded a queen. It shocked the whole of Europe. <laughs> Little teaser. So I'm going to bop back. Talk about the restaurants. That that's it. Yeah. I find that's intriguing. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it just seems like a different life now. But I uh, moved to New York to go to acting school, and I studied under this uh, very respectable acting teacher who basically taught a lot of the greats, this guy, Bill Esper, and graduated in the early 2000s. And then I, you know, started auditioning and doing a lot of plays, Broadway, off-Broadway, into bed and film, but couldn't really support myself as an actor, so I was always bartending. And then after around eight years of doing that in my late 20s, I kind of burnt out, and I decided that I wanted to open up a whiskey bar, because at that time I was working in a really good whiskey 
I learned a lot, I had lo- learned a lot about whiskey, uh, especially Scotch whiskey. So myself and my friend decided to open up a Scotch whiskey bar that was quite accessible and down to earth and kind of cool in the West Village uh, called Highlands. And we opened it and it was very successful. And then we opened up another one on the Lower East Side called Mary Queen of Scots. There you go. A, a forebearer to my to my history, uh, my history nerd podcast docuseries. But um, and then the, then we opened up Whitehall in another in the place in the West Village. And then we had a place in Montauk called the Surf Lodge. So we were very busy. And then that was another 10 years, you know, eight, 10 years of that of madness around nightlife and restaurants. But then I missed acting so much and I, I kind of really felt like I needed to be creative. So I kind of got back into acting and writing and then started to actually work, you know, people. I don't think people really knew what to do with me in my <laughs> late 20s. But by the time I got into my late 30s, I was a little bit more castable. I'd kind of grown into myself. So I started to work pretty consistently, got a really good team. And then from there, I started writing. And then that's where I met him. I was going to say, where did you meet him? Right How did you meet him? He came to Highlands. He came to one of my bars. I went through a, like a, a breakup where I was with this guy who uh, all of my friends were moving to New York. Uh, excuse me, moving to LA. And I was in New York and I kind of panicked. And there was this guy that kind of like, love bombed me stalked me he was coming to the restaurants all the time wasn't really that into him but he just seemed like a really solid guy <laughs> so I basically like was like okay I'll go out, I'll date you and I ended up kind of like being in a relationship with him for a year moved in with him and then basically we we broke up kind of in a very strange way he went out of nowhere one day he just kind of like ended it and, and looking back it was the best ever thing that ever happened right. to me because we were so not meant to be together but it was very traumatic at the time so I moved to LA for three months to be with my friend and we wrote a script. And then um, when, when I was coming back to New York from LA at that time, I said to myself, okay, well, I can go on all these dating apps or I have one of the coolest bars in the West Village. I could have a gay party on a Sunday. So I decided that I would do like a tea dance kind of a thing starting at two. And we had this party, myself and my friends called Matriarch where everybody had to invite, all the gays had to invite their female best friend. And it was a celebration of women. And um, so basically all these all these uh, gay guys would bring their fag hag, essentially, to Highlands on a Sunday. We played like disco music. And it was a hit, let me tell you. Because a lot of these women like were, were very successful. And a lot, some of them were mothers, were boyfriends and everything. But that was the once a month party they would go to. Everybody would be left at home. All the kids, all the husbands would be like on babysitting duty. And they would come and get wasted. So they would, uh, 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 more deals were done at that party. Like with all these bad bitches in New York, like in the corner, exchanging numbers, setting up meetings. It was a real success. But anyway, the very first one I threw, uh, Emerus walked in. And uh, he was introduced to me by my very good friend, Eddie Roach. And he, I bought him a couple of drinks. I, th- I guess he thought I was straight. And uh, my friend Eddie was like, no, honey, she's as gay as a goose. So basically, yeah. And he he was very funny. He came up, I was DJing, you know, very cool. And then he comes up and he's like, you know, I have to leave, but can I take you for a drink sometime? And I was like, sure. Do you want my Instagram? Like an absolute douchebag. I was like, do you want my Instagram? And he was like, no, I don't want your Instagram. I want your number. I was like, ooh, this guy is, you know, kind of cool. Or, you know, there was so much like games played or there is so much games played with guys and, you know, people don't want to be like too keen or whatever. And he was just like straight out asking for my number. So then, yeah, we basically, um, we started dating. We took it really slow. Like we, you know, it took us, we didn't move in with each other until COVID. I mean, we were in no rush. I mean, we started working together pretty soon, writing, but we weren't, you know, like it was really nice. Um, everything took a nice, was at a nice pace. So well, the first guy be for the guy before him, you settled and you shouldn't have done that, right? Yeah, never settle. Because it just comes back to kind of, it comes back to bite you in the ass, you know? I mean, you know, it wasn't fair on him. It wasn't fair on me. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's, he was definitely a little bit emotionally damaged. I mean, this guy, I mean, I, I wonder if he's actually in relationship now or capable of relationship. He, he, was, he had a very odd personality. Hope he listens to this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I mean, like he's, uh, you know, Emerson and I were just very, very well suited. We're definitely meant to be together. So I'm very grateful that that happened. I talked with Emrys about this, but so he kind of was one of the two guys that helped rescue our play that we just finished, Boys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I assume you came and watched it. Of course. Yeah. What what were your feelings watching him up there? Well, you know, it's interesting. I know that play really well Uh because my 
one of my best friends uh, is was in the production on Broadway, Zach, Zach Quinto. So Zach and I were like really like running around New York at that period. It was the height of our, both of us were single and, and he was doing Boys in the Band with all the guys that I love, Bo, Matt Bomer and Andrew, Andrew Reynolds and Parsons and everybody. They're all super cool. It was a real moment. They all got along really well. So I was kind of wrapped up in that whole world. And then when Emmer said, and that play has always had a very special, because I remember seeing it when I was, as a kid, late at night. Wow. They, they, they put it on TV. I remember reading the TV guide that, there was, that it was on. It was like this very scandalous movie, gay movie. And I stayed up really late one night and I watched it and I was blown away. And uh, so anyway, that, that play has always really, I don't know, given, given me just such kind of like, I really feel like it's just a moment in history. And I just right. love, I love the writing. And when it's done well, it's just so amazing. So, so were, you, were you afraid when he said he to do it? Yeah, long, long story short, now that I've name dropped up the wazir. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I was a little nervous and exci- obviously very excited. And, um, you know, it's like a new theater company in Palm Springs. I mean, I didn't know. I was like, okay, because Emerus has had big credits. He's done, he's been on the West End and all that. So I was like, are you sure you want to do this? It's a small part, the cowboy and all the rest. And he was like, no, we really wanted to get back into acting. It had been a while. So I was like, okay. So I fully supported it, helped him with the lines. I went to see the play on the night after opening night. Again, I was very nervous. I, I haven't smoked in a long time, but I was like chain smoking at the front. I couldn't get anyone to give me a light. I, I, to ask, I didn't have a light and everyone was, I was asking these people for a light and they looked at me like I was crazy. And it, but um, the re- no one smokes anymore, especially not in Palm Springs. But I, um, so I, I gathered myself, was with a couple of friends, went in, curtain came out and I, right, right out the gate, I could tell that Terry was, he just had a real, I, I knew I was in safe hands. Like I was like, okay, you know, because if that's not, you know, if Michael's not good, well then the whole thing was just going to be, it's going to be painful two hours for your life, right? Well, they're, they're all links in the chain. Oh, right? oh no, absolutely. I, I, yeah, obviously Michael's very important. And yeah, he, yeah. He, he totally knocked it out of the Oh, Harold. And, well, I mean, they all are as well, but like Donald, they're all of them. Right. But you know, like just because the first like 10 minutes is just him and Donald. Right. And then again, also, I'm not sure the actor's name that played Donald. Um, he, Scott. Scott. Scott was amazing. Too. But then I settled into it and then I just let it wash over me. And to be honest with you, I haven't seen, a, I haven't seen it done so well in a long time. Um, it was just so clear. I think Mart Crowley will be very, very proud of what you guys did with that. I absolutely loved the production. The only thing I would say was that like, I was like, was so sad that it was only on for two weekends. That was my only regret. Oh well. man, they were. Uh, can you imagine if they were doing it like for like a month, even like a month, like because they were all just so like, they were just finding their footing, you know. Yeah. But hey ho, I mean that's just the way it goes. And well, um, I've, I've kept all the notes and everything. I so could easy jump back up. Back. I yeah, I yeah. seriously. Yeah. And it was also like a, it was a hit. Like everyone, by the time the second weekend rolled around, there was only there was standing room only. So look, I, I to to answer your question, I had all the fields possible for that, and I was just so proud of Emerson. He was hilarious and amazing. He looked incredible. And then the, uh, all of the guys, every single one of them, were just amazing. I was gushing at the little rap party that you threw. I was like going up to all of them, just being like, "Jesus, guys, amazing!" But they're all good act. They're all like good, act- like proper actors. I mean, they have careers. I don't know. I was thinking that it was going to be a lot of people that were just kind of like you know, like had community community theater, community theater yeah. or whatever. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Like these guys had mass. Uh, had really like a lot of them have been on like tons of t- done tons of TV, tons of theater. So no, there was no no flies on that production. I'll say cool. Talk about Emrys. What do you like about him? Um, well, he's extraordinary, beautiful. <laughs> no, I mean, right. that's well, yeah. If if the guys in the audience knew that he was your husband, they'd all be like <laughs> green with that V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, he works very hard on that, which can be a little bit boring if you're if you're, if you're the partner. To be honest with you, oh. um, I love him dearly. Um, I, he's he's so kind. Yeah, uh, he's one of the he's the kindest person I think I've ever met in my life. Not just saying that because he's my husband. He's just a very very kind hardworking, uh, sweet man. Yeah. Um, he's just, he's er, like being there for me in, in just ways that just completely blow my mind. And he's given me the opportunity to just be able to be myself and, and work on things that I love. And um, we have so much fun together. Mm-hmm. We just ne- there's always, we're, we're, ne- we're always chit-chatting away. We always have something to say to each other. 
always something to work on, always lots going on. It's never boring. Do you have any arguments? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, like, in the, Jesus, like, during COVID and stuff like that, absolutely. It was, there was, there was, there's, because we, as you can probably tell, have a lot going on and we, we've changed, we switched gears so much. There's a lot of kind of, it, sometimes it can make it a little stressful, like, we'll take on too much or, like, during COVID, he was editing the movie, I was renovating on Idlewild. Both of us felt like we weren't getting the the dues that we deserved. But no, you know, lately actually, since we're we're married in, oh, just over a year now, and we haven't really fought in a while. If it, if, it, if it's ever going, if it ever gets to that point, we kind of usually like pull back and we're like, you know, like we'll just we've gotten to a good rhythm, right? Um, yeah, you know, relationships, marriage, man. I mean, hard work, very hard work. I'd say I think it's so much easier to be by yourself because you don't right. you don't. You can justify anything to yourself, right? You don't, you know, you don't have to answer to anyone. You can right. be like, "Oh, well, that person's a dick." Oh, I was fine. Like, whereas it's very confronting to be in a relationship. Right. You have to really like, especially the kind of relationship that's worthwhile—a relationship where someone's going to call you out and be honest with you and right. push you, and, you know, not not allow you to be not your best self over a long period of time. It's okay to not be your best self, like every once in a while. Nobody, we're not none of us are saints, but consistently over time, you get called out big time. So what's coming up on the horizon for you? Well, we've got um, several things kind of in the works, too, that come to mind. There's a, a documentary that we're making, again, kind of with fits into our ethos, it's like a queer history documentary about the late 70s, a okay. musical band of the late 70s. And then we also have a, uh, a feature film, a, a script that I wrote. Uh, it's basically a, a modern adaptation of Heinrich Ibsen's Hedda Gabler. Um, I am not familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's a it's like the female Hamlet. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, uh, yeah, and that's set in Ireland actually, against the kind of political backdrop of Ireland. It's almost like a Succession meets House of Cards kind of a okay. like set in Ireland kind of a f- feature film. So, yeah, we'll be busy for the foreseeable future. I hope. So before we end, I I usually ask my my guest, "What have you learned in your life that you could pass on to my people? What are some lessons you've learned?" Don't take yourself too seriously. That's a good one. Work hard, but remember that it is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm-hmm. And it's all about intention. Sometimes things don't work out and you can give yourself a hard time. Maybe you were you feel like you were mean or you feel like you didn't have compassion for yourself. But remember to take a step back, take a 30,000 foot view and ask yourself, what was my intention? And if your intentions are good and you feel like sometimes things aren't working out as, as you thought, just remember... Keep your intentions good and good things will happen. Good words. <laughs> thanks, Thank, thanks for coming in, Donald. Thank you so much for Appreciate having it. me. <laughs> okay. Well, have you, I would like both of you to come back and maybe talk about that movie. I want to hear more about it. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Thank you.